Hey guys, so how many in here actually know who Jay Fielerbrand is? So there's a, a little bit of knowledge about it, excellent. So I was asked to come up and, and talk a little bit about what we actually do and, and what we see in terms of uh, moving wine in bulk. But to be able to do that, we wanted to, uh, to draw parallels to the different types of shipments. So it'll be a little bit uh, 101 education, but then it'll also draw into to the actual wine shipments. Myself, I worked for Hillebrand for 18 years, uh, Danish by origin. Did about uh, seven years in, in Russia. We dealt a lot with the bulk wine. Uh, two years in Chile, which is obviously one of the big uh, bulk regions. Five years in Canada, and the last four years I've been in the US and managing North America. So Jay Fillerbrand is two different companies that you guys might have heard in the industry. So the Jay Fillerbrand is the beer, wine, and spirits division that is extremely integrated. We, we're about 2,500 people globally. We are in 89 countries. We're located where you have a wine consumption market of significant size or uh, an origin where they produce beer, wine, or spirits. The second division of, of our company is called Transocean. Transocean was acquired in 2007. They specialize in industrial bulk liquids, but they also engineer the actual flexi tank. So when we're talking about bulk wine transport, it's uh, the actual flexi tank is a, an extremely important piece of the, of the transport. So we control the engineering, the research and development, and we produce them in three different countries where we own the factories. So we produce the whole, we control the whole supply chain in the actual production of the flexi tank. So this company is quite well known to some of the big wine producers because we work extremely close with the tech teams of the wine producers and actually the winemakers to understand how the wine reacts in the different types of materials. So the, the flexi tank development has been going on for, for many, many years. So we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later on. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, what is bulk shipping? The advantages of bulk shipping. We're gonna get into the, uh, the different equipment options. Industry safety, this is a key point for us. Quality control, and then the, the general bulk supply chain. So defining bulk cargo. For, for us, bulk is a product that is sold unpacked in large quantities. Uh, the really big quantities is gonna be bulk tankers. So we have bulk tankers for certain customers. We don't operate them ourselves, but you see them in the market, and people can move 500,000 liters, but they can go all the way up to 5 million liters. So this is quite a chunk of wine or spirits. When you see these vessels, they go to one destination, and then it's difficult to get them back, right? So sometimes you send them back empty. Uh, but it's big compartments of 250,000 liters, so it's, it's quite a commitment to make. We don't see these very often on the US trade. Uh, on the wine side, we see them a little bit on the spirit side. Then isotanks and flexi tanks, very popular in terms of international transportation. You also see them a little bit on road transportation. Uh, but then the bulk trailers are very popular in California between wineries. We see them move, uh, move grape juice between uh, production facilities. So we also have bulk movements that are a little bit smaller, which is palletized, and those two are drums and, and IPCs and totes. So these are a little bit different. Uh, totes, drums, we also see a little bit in the spirits business, but then really the whole definition here between bulk and case goods is the case good is on a pallet, right? We haven't put kegs in here because kegs is a little bit different, but, uh, but this is how we see products move in, in bulk liquids. So the advantage, we wanted to draw a little bit of a comparison on what is actually in a, in a flexi tank compared to a dry container because when, when we're talking about how can we save cost in the bulk supply chain, well, I assume that we're talking about how can we look at transformation from the case goods business into the bulk business and what's the savings and what's the benefits, right? So when we look at case goods business, you, you load a 40-foot container, you have 21 pallets, then you ship about 10,500 liters of wine. This goes from the production, bottling at origin, it goes into a container, we ship it, and it arrives to the market. If you look at the 
bulk wine shipments, well, it goes straight from production into a flexi tank and we ship it in big volumes. And then it arrives to bottling facility at destination and then it goes to market. Here we, we load 24,000 liters. So obviously in one movement on a vessel, there's a big optimization here in terms of, of capacity. So we see this is very, very common. I think uh, Damien was talking about the Australian wine, wine market that it uh, kind of got commoditized uh, 10, 15 years ago. 67% of the volumes out of Australia that goes to UK, which is the biggest market for them, is bulk. So this is pretty significant. You don't have the same market shares on case goods versus bulk to the US, and there's, there's different reasons for that, but it is becoming a really big player in the industry, and we're very integrated in it. So we took a look at how much does it actually cost to move a flexi tank from FOB Spain to door delivery in Napa. So all in cost, 4750 4, This includes the, the transportation, the flexi tanks, the, the custom clearance. So this is 20 cents per liter. So this obviously, you have certain cost at destinations in terms of bottling and storage. But then when you look at the cost to move a, a container, well, to reach the same amount of liters for the same move internationally, you have to move 2.3 40-foot containers at 40 cents a liter. So it's half the price. So what does that really mean? Well, for us, this is just a comparison. It's a benchmark. But then for you guys as, as customers or producers or the owner of getting the product into market, you have to decide if this is the right strategy for the brand, right? So there's definitely pros and cons in this, uh, in this type of business. So we were talking about the, uh, the big box uh, supermarket chains, private labels. This is what you see a lot in the, in the bulk market. You have the opportunity to drive big volumes. You can create private labels. You can react fast in terms of blending and adjusting private labels when you have big volumes close to your supermarkets. So this is what we see. Um, you can also add it to your local blends in terms of you have an American Cabernet Sauvignon, you can still add 10% of a certain grape from another, from another origin, right? The tax advantage is something that is bigger in certain countries than others, but here you do pay a lower tax uh, when you import bulk versus case goods, so this also has a, has a benefit for you guys. One of the disadvantages is the geographical bottling point in the US. Because when you look at the US today, it's very, very heavily dominated in California. You have a lot of facilities out here that can, that can store bulk wine, that can bottle bulk wine, uh, and you can do different things. It's very different on the East Coast. You don't have as many qualified facilities that can really take a really big brand, take it in, bottle it, and distribute it. If you look at a brand like Yellowtail, it's probably uh, one of the most popular brands out of Australia is still moving in case goods because majority of the market is in New Jersey and, uh, and New York, so they don't have a bottling facility there. There's also other political reasons in terms of the, the supplier, et cetera, et cetera, because there's a whole supply chain, right? But in the U.S., the, the bottling is, is dominated by California. So you also have to commit to 24,000 liter to make this cost beneficial. So a lot of people have asked us lately, well, can you do a tank that's 10,000 uh, liters or can you do maybe 12,000 liters? We can, but it's much more of a spot business then because when you look at the whole industry, the, the concept of shipping bulk wine is to maximize the payload up to 24,000 liter. That's what we can move legally on the roads. So this is what everybody wants to do to get the cost down per liter, right? So this is also when you look at equipment positioning. We have to put equipment in Italy. We have to put equipment in Australia to be able to load in accordance to your, to your forecast. If you guys suddenly want to use 12,000 liters, 13,000 liters, then we also have to produce them and we have to put them into the market, which means that's probably eight weeks out. So, and then you also don't get the same savings in terms of cost per liter. We've seen this happen because there was a gentleman over here earlier that mentioned bulk wine transport is no longer just an economical wine. It's not a cheap wine. It's quality wine. 
I think seven, eight years ago, we saw uh, juice moving at 20 cents a liter. That's the commercial value of, of the wine. Today, we see juice moving at three, four dollars a liter in flexi tanks. So the industry has changed. The perception of the flexi tanks has also changed from a winery perspective and from a, uh, a winemaker perspective because it's been accepted. And the quality when it arrives is pretty much the same as when it loaded in origin. So when you compare it to the packaged product, then packaged product is premium market. It still is because there is a certain brand recognition. I don't think you're going to see a Chateau Neuf du Pop in a flexi tank uh, within the next couple of years because there's a certain image about that product. So we do say that, that it's the premium market. Uh, you also have the E-State bottle authentic, uh, authenticity, which, uh, which is important for, uh, for certain brands. And then you do have supply chain flexibility because if you have a small premium product and you need to ship one pallet to 10 different states, then it is more cost beneficial to move a container to New York and spread it out to, to the different states. So we work with big companies. We work with small companies. But when you look at the bulk business, really the top five guys almost represent 80% of what's moving in the market. So a little bit similar to what John was mentioning, and you see the, the top 10 uh, wholesalers in the US, they represent 75 to 80% of the business. It's the same in the bulk business. But that is changing. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So packaged product, you have higher transport costs, you have a, a longer lead time when you're looking at getting to market because you gotta wait for the wineries to put your back labels on, your colas, et cetera, et cetera. Equipment options. So the benefits on a flexi tank is that you have global availability. So we can, in principle, load a couple of weeks after you give us the, uh, you give us the order. You have a cost advantage. You can move these on road, rail, and ocean transport. So it provides you a lot of flexibility. And it's a single use. So flexi tanks, normally, is recyclable. So you can recycle it, and then the container can go back to the port. Right? The limitations, in a flexi tank, you are not allowed to put spirits because then it becomes flammable when you put it in those big volumes. Technical support, it's important that you have some kind of a, a company or logistics company that can help you with technical support because if there is an issue, then you need to be able to assist on it. We've had situations where the shipping line, you know, they, they are part of our supply chain and we have to work with them, but they may put a container in Manzanillo for a couple of weeks and there may be a problem with the container that, let's say, is leaking or, or something. Then we have to attend it, and we need to make sure that we can cross-pump it into a new flexi tank and take it into, into the market. These type of things we need to be able to do on a global basis so we can bring the product to final destination. So technical support is super important in, in our business, and we train suppliers that are not used to working with flexi tanks or importers that are not used to working with flexi tanks, we train them in accordance to how you load, what you need to do, what you cannot do. So that's part of our business. Just mentioned 15 to 24,000 liters is what we normally see, but it goes all the way down to 10, 13,000 liters as well. It's just not common because it's not as cost effective, obviously. Isotank. These we see a lot in the spirits business. So the, uh, the positives here, you can move spirits up, in, up to 26,000 liters. In the US, we don't use 26,000 liters because of road restrictions. So we mainly use 24,000 liters. Um, it's a lot easier to load and unload these than, than a flexi tank. You can also get these temperature control, which sometimes we see in the beer business. So we're actually moving beer in temperature controlled uh, ISO tanks, so it's, uh, it's happening now in the, in the craft beer, and then bottle it at destination. And we, we reuse these. So we run a fleet of 600 ISO tanks. The challenge is you take an ISO tank from Scotland with whiskey and you take it to Montreal, then now do you, what do you do with it, right? Then we fill it up with rye and then we send it to Australia. There's no spirits going from Australia back to Europe, so either we take it back empty or we ask one of the wineries, 
could we put wine in this instead of a flexi tank and we give you a discount, we bring it back to Europe. So this is a little bit complex when it comes to uh, equipment that's reusable because you gotta send them all around the world where the flexi tank, it's a one-way product. So it makes it very flexible, right? So limitations, availability, repositioning, cleaning and contamination. You need to make sure that you know how to clean a, an ISO tank so it can be reused again next time. Obviously, these are all food grade. We only move uh, food graded products in them, but still, there is a process behind it. We had a conversation the other day. If it's kosher, then it has to be cleaned in a different way. So there's a lot of management and control of moving ISO tanks. So there's a per diem cost. So this is something that we manage, obviously, in, in accordance to moving them around. Uh, and then they are higher cost price compared to the flexi tank. 15 years ago, a lot of people were moving wine in ISO tanks and they didn't trust the flexi tanks. So there has definitely been a twist towards the flexi tank business taking over from the ISO tank business when you look at the wine business. If there's any questions in these, then just raise a hand. Huh? It's an uh, open forum. Totes, John was mentioning that the young millennials, they want more new products. They want to try something different. We are seeing this as well because we constantly are asked, can we just import 1,000 liters because we want to test it? And this is, we want to put it on kegs, we want to put it in cans, we want to put it in 500 milliliter bottles. We see this a lot now. And this is, it's a difficult product to manage in terms of, uh, of the logistics because nobody wants to own these totes. So in principle, the, the suppliers say, okay, we, we can buy them, but, the, but then you're going to be stuck with the tote when it arrives to destination, right? So this is a little bit of a challenge, uh, but we see it happening today because people want to test it. People want to do sangria in kegs or they want to do sangria in cans. So we see actually a lot of this stuff coming into the East Coast where people are playing with new products. Um, we see these now also coming in different types of qualities. So you can get a tote from $200 all the way up to $1,500, and you can get it as a steel tote. You can put spirits in it, et cetera, et cetera. We mention here non-hazard liquids because this, the totes that we really see in our industry that comes from wineries are the, the standard totes. So we say quality concerns, that's just what we hear, but it is more difficult to control these because nobody is taking ownership of it. Nobody is saying, we're gonna clean it like this, this is the process to clean it, we're gonna bring it into our facilities. So it's just a little bit harder to manage. Industry safety. So the shipping lines went together and created what was called the COA, Container Owners Association, because they wanted to make sure that they could protect their containers, they could protect what happened on the ships when these flexi tanks were moving uh, on their vessels. Because when you put 24,000 liters in a big bag inside of a container, it puts tremendous pressure on the container walls. So sometimes the wineries, you might actually receive uh, cargo coming in from Latin America and it kind of bulges out. Uh, so the container walls are, are pushed out. So the shipping line wanted to make sure that they could protect themselves. So in 2008, they launched a dedicated flexi tank division who were gonna take a look at how do we protect this? How do we make sure that our containers are not broken? How do we make sure that it's not leaking. So this is not just the wine, this is also in the industrial business where they're transporting drilling oil and all kinds of different things. So Hillebrand has actually played a key role in this together with a couple of the other guys that are producing a lot of flexi tanks. So we were involved with the shipping lines, helping them to guide towards controlling the, uh, the flexi tanks that go in here. So today you see you have 65 flexi tank companies that are approved, which means if you're not approved by the COA, to move flexi tanks, then they won't put the container on the vessel. So in, uh, in January 2009, they did a flexi tank code of practice. And then in September 2016, they had what they call the PAS 1008. So we're going to talk about these uh, in, in, in just a second. Oh, that's right. So flexi tank code of practice means how do we actually manage 
the process of loading flexi tanks. So they came up with uh, with a manual that told us, okay, this is what you need to do to manage a proper flexi tank shipment, which is how do you select the container? How do you actually mark the containers? How do you manage your incidents? So it came all the way down to how do we, as a logistics provider, manage our depots that also fit the containers with these, uh, with these flexi tanks. So when we receive a container, we make sure that it's only five years old because we don't want to have old containers because there's a, a bigger risk of uh, the walls breaking, et cetera, et cetera. We also check it for is there any nails in the, in the ground? Is there any uh, metal sticking out on the walls? And then we patch it up. We, uh, we take the nails out. We, we clean it. And then we prepare it for shipment. So a flexi tank shipment is not just a flexi tank. There's a whole process behind it where we need to make sure that we prepare it well. So when it comes to the winery, you just fill it up and off it goes, right? Um, Incident management, insurance, we control the flexi tank all the way to the final destination. If there is a problem with the product when it arrives, we know that this flexi tank was made of this and this material that came from this and this batch from the polyethylene factory in China. And if this flexi tank had an issue, maybe there's also an issue with some of the other batches, and then we take a look at it. So, there is a really, really strong compliance process behind the scenes of a flexi tank. The, uh, the PAS uh, 1008 is ex exactly compliance on production of a flexi tank. So how do you control the, uh, the production of it? So we've seen a lot of these type of products come into market, but it's, uh, they have a lot of issues. So the shipping lines don't want to have leakage of all kinds of products on their ships because depending on the type of product, they might have to go into port en route and get it all cleaned up. So it has been a really big topic in the industry. You can see in the containers uh, some of this key information. You can see in the container how old it is. So this is uh, actually done uh, manually in the port when we pick them up. So we thought we should uh, put a couple of questions up here or, or things to consider when, when you guys look at uh, flexi tank quality and how you select your, your providers. So uh, the manufacturers of this flexi tank, um, do they have any uh, quality standards and, and what are they? Compliance, are they part of the uh, COA? Material, what type of material is the flexi tank actually made of? Is it a 100% virgin grade? Is it, is it transparent or opaque? This is nice to see when you're unloading it because you actually want to be able to see if you're receiving white wine or, or red wine because that depends on which tank it's going to go into. And this is probably one of the most important ones, the barrier. So the barrier can have an effect on the quality of the wine. So this is earlier I was mentioning that we work extremely closely with the, uh, with the wineries and the winemakers. We had a container a couple of years ago, and there were naphthalene in it. So there was naphthalene in the wine when they tested it, and then they came back to us and said, you have a problem with your flexi tank. So we worked together with them, and we went back and forth. And after about a month, we realized that the container we had used had been painted, and it was the paint that had gotten into the actual wine. So this is really extreme, and it's, uh, it's something that we need to work very closely with. So Obviously, then we adjust. The flexi tanks today are really a technology. It's, it's, it's an engineering product, and, and the big suppliers here in California have played a key role to be able to get us to a level where we can actually control this whole process because wine is a living product, right? So this is important when you talk to flexi tank producers. You need to make sure that they're certified, EU and FDA standards, and what is the research and development of, uh, of the valve? If, is it capable of, of connecting to your facilities and, and how, how, does, how is it managed? So the same with the tank. If you work with tank operators in the spirits business, is it, uh, is it owned by, uh, by Gila brand or is it a third party? The, uh, the commodity is ISO certified. Can you, can you actually load hazard materials? And then there's also a compliance, which is, uh, which is similar to the flexi tank, which is in accordance to the ISO tank business. And you need EU and FDA standards. So 
For us, when we look at this from the uh, external side, then brand integrity, at least that's what we hear from our customers, play a key role in the business. So e-state versus local bottling, that, that makes a difference when they decide if they want to move it from case goods to, uh, to flexi tank business. Also the quantity, there has to be a certain scalability of the product for, for it to make sense. And then the facilities, where are you actually going to? Where is your market? If 100% of your business is in New York and the best opportunity to bottle it is in California and you're shipping out of France, maybe it makes more sense to do case goods business. But that depends on the product, it depends on the destination of your market, and it depends on the country that you're working in. In the UK, all the supermarkets are doing bottling, but the, market, the, the country is much smaller, so it's easier to serve the whole market with a couple of bottling facilities, right? And then the logistics. Are we dealing with spirits? Are we dealing with wine? And, and what's the cost? And can you actually get a full service package from your logistics provider, right? There's plenty of companies out there that are doing it. J. Filibrand is one of them. It's the only thing we do, so we're quite dedicated to the business. And we try to be committed to the alcohol industry and the wine business because you guys make us better when we look at developing products further. So what to look for? For us, we believe it's a key advantage that you are in control and that you own the production of a flexi tank because you need to make sure that the flexi tank is the right quality. You need to have a team that can provide you a logistic solution, which is similar to us. You need to make sure that you can manage your risk. So managing your risk, there's a lot of different things, but a good example is if, you, uh, if we have a problem with our production of flexi tanks in Malaysia and the factory has to close down, we can still source our flexi tanks out of the factory in South Africa, right? So these things play a role if you're working on large scale business and you're moving a lot of containers because you cannot allow hiccups in the supply chain. Fitting and technical assistance, this is critical. Some wineries in California, they bottle and they load 24 seven. If there's a problem at three o'clock at night when they're loading flexi tanks, people call us and we actually attend and we help them with this is what you need to do to be able to load the, the unit, right? Safety, recycling, sustainability. Do we have processes in place? Do we have processes that people follow and is it, is it kept in check? Absolutely. And then the global network. Loading a flexi tank is not a done sale. You still need to have it arrive at destination. You still need to make sure that it's, it's being unloaded properly and you still need to make sure that you get 24,000 liters out of the flexi tank, right? Because it is a big bag. So could there be 500 liters left in it? Could there be 1,000 liters left in it? We need to make sure that people know how to unload as well. So, so this was what I had to, uh, to pitch in with today. It was really the, uh, uh, the view from a, from a logistics perspective. We work with the 80 pound gorillas who are probably in this room today. We also work with the small guys that are doing totes and are doing 12,000 liters. We see a trend in the market where more and more people want to try and do new things. And we try to help. It's a little bit harder sometimes because they want to load a 10,000 liter flexi tank out of Slovenia where we've never had a flexi tank there before, but we can do it. Uh, so there's a solution to everything. We are also at booth number 83 if you have any questions. Any questions? into, there is facilities out there, it's just limited capacity. So depending on, uh, are you looking at receiving uh, 10 flexies a week, then it's probably a tank capacity issue. But you have, you have guys that operate out there, you have um, uh, Brothers International, you have uh, Gotham Projects together with, uh, with Free Flow Wine, they operate out there. So you definitely have people that, that, that operate. Constellation have, a, have their own facility up in, uh, up in New York. So 
But when you look at it on the West Coast from an outsourced perspective, you know, Constellation doesn't really do it for other people. Uh, in California, you can, you can find a list of 10 people that can do it for you, and you can find storage capacity rather, rather easy. The storage capacity is a, is a challenge in, uh, on the East Coast. Is it something that makes sense? I think if, if someone has to start a project like that, then there has to be a pretty big anchor behind it to, uh, to fund a project like this. How cold can you keep an ISO tank? I think it goes down to minus 18. Yeah. So when we look at the, uh, at the flexi tank business, because maybe uh, that's an, an interesting point, we can put wine or any alcohol product up to 22% alcohol into a flexi tank. So depending on the type of, of product. So in principle, we could also move vermouth in flexi tank. Um, but the, the ISO tanks is heavy spirits and then craft beer. That was it for today. That was the last speaker. Steve, are you uh, making some closing notes?